Hello everyone, I am Michele Macchioni, the Vice President for uh, Data Infrastructure Processing and Automation, and I will be starting this webinar for the 2022.3 Hyperworks release uh, concerning uh, what we have done uh, in terms of post-processing and automation. I'm going to give, uh, first of all, uh, an agenda on the content that we are going to touch base uh, during this, uh, this hour. So, uh, we are going to speak about uh, HyperMesh Post, uh, specifically for the enhanced derived load case workflows and functionalities. Uh, I will spend some time also on the results query tool and uh, the legend enhancement. And then we will uh, dive into another uh, nice uh, uh, achievement on the marker plot. Then we're switching into what we can call HyperMesh plot. So still on post-processing, but still in HyperMesh uh, as an application for both the curve editor and the new chart entity. We'll be then uh, uh, discussing briefly on the announcement about report for the support of the multi-model infrastructure. And then uh, on Hyperview, with a grid announcement uh, specifically for the Hyperview player, but also on the main application. And then last but not the least, uh, we will touch base on the Hyperworks common language, uh, HWC, on the support for derived load cases uh, and other announcement, and as well give you guys update uh, on the extensions management. Obviously, before uh, diving into all this topic, uh, I would definitely want to mention my uh, big thanks, not just on all the PM team, but specifically to the development guys uh, and the um, QA folks, uh, which have been uh, more than key uh, asset uh, to accomplish uh, the achievement that we did for uh, uh, this release. So um, moving on on the HyperMesh post, as I was mentioning, the first announcement and workflow change or the uh, lifting that we did was on the drive load cases that we introduced actually together with the first release of HyperMesh post. But why this uh, announcement is very good? For me, for two major reasons. First of all, because we are really now fully connected with the same backend functionality for which is we call our data to unleash all the operators in terms of uh, derived load cases. We now support this announcement uh, also with the full metric definitions for the envelope. This is a very key request uh, uh, specifically for uh, all the customers that are dealing with envelope and they want to set up uh, the metric uh, um, considering uh, not just uh, the data type and the data component, but also the layers uh, and specifically are uh, the systems, uh, the averaging method uh, and as well the corner data. We do have uh, the possibility now to nest uh, all the newly generated uh, load cases under the same folder and to rename them, which makes uh, the usability of uh, this functionality boosted uh, and uh, very user friendly. Uh, we also add uh, data names uh, inside uh, the entity editor. Uh, these are not editable, but they are available for the users to review the content of either the LSPs or the envelope that have been generated. And we have introduced a new data type capability, which is the envelope trace. For those that have been using the drive load case workflow with the HyperMesh post, we know that specifically for envelope, we do create the metric because we want to return all the quantities which have been found based on the load case distribution. So we do have the metric, but on the data type, for instance, if we select stress XX in material system, the output that you can have in HyperMesh is the complete stress tensor and all the other elemental bound data found by the distributions of these load cases. So retrieving what was the original definitions for which you have been let's say requesting the envelope sometimes can be requesting a few more clicks. Right now it's just request one, which is the one on the data type to chase for the envelope trace column value. And basically you will see exactly what are the values that the application has been found to be then based for the maximum or minimum distribution. Okay, so this is a great announcement and I think this will boost the usability and the capabilities uh, in the offering uh, of this functionality. Uh, moving on, we also made uh, 
some very good announcement on the results query tools. Uh, two are directly exposed from the GUI is we had the possibility to change the output options also into the scientific format. Another small request, but I believe important, was to have the header file, so the list of all the load cases available, not print out. And then we see that this has been introduced in the new preference file under um, the post tab. And through the XML definition, we do now have the possibility to overwrite globally and locally the settings. We do support now the XML definitions also to output the tensor data on global and user defined system also by using this is called projected system. So basically projecting the tensor quantities from a global or let's say user defined system into the plane of the shells. This was already there in Hyperview since ages, and now this is available as well in HyperMesh Post, still under the XML definition, everything though documented. And we have added the possibility, as you can see here in this XML definition, the capability of directly put a kind of a wildcard to execute a query for all the load cases available on the given results file. On the Results query tool, there is a very good enhancement. This is a work in progress in general on performances and improvement also when it comes to memory management. Uh, I want to showcase here a test case uh, on uh, a customer model, a big XDB of around 22 gigabyte with, uh, let's say, 600,000 elements and around 422. 30 load cases. Um, on the startup uh, on a machine, we were around 14 gig. Then uh, by importing the deck, uh, because of the content, all the properties and materials, uh, we were reaching around 18 gigabyte. Then uh, the results uh, after the import of, uh, let's say, the pointer to the XDB querying uh, um, let's say a few elements uh, and few data type, we were reaching a peak memory of uh, almost 38 gigabyte to then end over into a plateau of 26. And you can imagine that if you had uh, a machine with, uh, let's say, namely 32 gigabyte, this was leading to crash. And obviously, nobody wants to have uh, the machine crashing. So we have been working on this profile and then we have been reaching a memory peak reductions from the um, uh, 19 uh, gigabyte to seven to 6.7 gigabyte based on, uh, let's say, this uh, uh, starting point. And optionally, the memory release from the R data backend, which I always mention, is done at the uh, end of the query. We do have a clean results memory cache in the preferences. And as I mentioned, this is a running project on keep on improving all the performances and memory management. Um, another important update, as you know, in the previous release, we have been focusing on adding the legend as an entity in HyperMesh, namely the numeric legend for contour vector and tensor we now are extending the support to the category legend for the contour plot to showcase the following category for the following contour plots. Uh, one which was heavily requested is the max layer and the mill layer. In the previous releases, we were just showing the ID of the plies, and now this is converted to the ply IDs or the layer IDs being either, let's say, ply or Z1 and Z2 for, let's say, the standard shell layers. And also for the envelope trace, this goes very well uh, into um, the discussions that I just had uh, when uh, we were discussing about the derived load cases. So we have the envelope trace for the subcase, and we can see the contour not just with the ID of the subcases, but with the label which we are getting from their definition. And last but not the least, we do have the contact status. So also as Hyperview was doing, we have the possibility to showcase the open, the frozen, the closed lip, like in this example for the contact. 
Um, before handing over to Sandesh for the next update on, on Hypermesh, I just want to refrain how, in my point of view, the content for this release was very good. We're also basically the foundations for much more development after a release that, as you know, has been extremely focused on the infrastructure and as well the removal of the post panel. Now the post panel is completely gone away in terms of items. So we are actually going uh, as I was uh, hoping and uh, development team and QA did a great job in the right direction. So without exiting more, I'm going to hand over to Sandesh Gandhi to talk about uh, another big announcement on Hypermesh Post uh, and then proceeding on the Hypermesh plot. Awesome, thank you, Michele. Let's begin. So first of all, let's let's talk about marker plots. This is something new that we have introduced in HM Post. Uh, from just looking at it, it would look like some annotations, but really, uh, yeah, that's exactly what it does. We try to plot results in text. So for for longest time, we have always seen results being plotted in some sort of a color or some sort of a vector or some sort of a tensor. Uh, this is just a new way of doing the same thing, but with text. So uh, although it's a condition of same thing uh, and it comes with the same infrastructure, such as being able to store the result definition or entity selection or even following the same logic, we try to provide uh, some extra value here with a mini legend uh, that uh, that usually helps you to uh, to navigate through the changing of whichever result type or which are quick properties that you want to edit on the screen. Uh, with, uh, without further ado, let's actually jump into a demo. So I have the same bullet exactly where I took the picture from. Uh, I have the same exact setup here. I have contours, vectors, tensor, everything created. We have added this uh, new entry right here. I can say mark a plot. Uh, this mark a plot now has the ability to now, first of all, ask you about the result definition. I'll go ahead, uh, create something. Let's say I stick with the displacement and I select a few uh, nodes. Once I do that, uh, and even going with the default settings, when I hit plot, uh, now this is going to create a quick annotation right here. At the same time, because it is telling me the uh, entity ID and the value on it, it's also telling me somewhere here that, okay, what exactly have you plotted on the screen? Uh, so if you change the result definition, obviously this will follow whatever you're talking about. Uh, you can always change the color of this uh, right from here, or you could be saying, Hey, I want to edit this plot and do something else with that. Uh, perfectly fine. There are some basic settings that are available. You could uh, change this from multi-line to single line, or you could say, I'm not interested in the entity ID, so let's just stick with the value. It kind of reduces the length of it, and when you have a lot of nodes on the screen, probably that will help. Uh, actually, a lot of markers on the screen, that might help. So we just created one definition, and that's how you see it already in the in the browser. And you also saw that because it's being stored as an uh, as a proper definition here, I can also retrieve it from the browser. A uh, lot of time, what happens is, uh, well, I have stress results on the screen, I have displacement, but eventually, I want the stress result with all the variations that I have done here as a as a marker plot as well. So there is an easy trick to it. You right click on this and there is an option to create marker plot. You click that and it copies all the settings from your stress definition or whichever contour definition you have, and it will then continue the logic on the same line. So then I'll select perhaps again the same element, perhaps another element, hit OK, and hit plot. So now it will switch to the new plot. Uh, so far, so good. Obviously, uh, just following the same logic as contour, vector, and tensor, uh, just like how you can keep only one contour type on the screen at a time, you can also keep only one marker type on the screen at a time. So that's that's a given rule of thumb that we are trying to follow. Uh, obviously, you can overlap this with any other plot types or as many plot types as you want, and it will continue to do its job. Uh, this looks pretty exciting uh, because it, it kind of gives you the first level of annotation. Somewhere along the lines, it might remind you of measurements that we had uh, in Hyperview, but from infrastructure or 
you know, GUI perspective, it does differ a little bit, uh, but we have definitely taken some inspiration from around. So that's about marker plots uh, and also about HM post in general. Let's quickly uh, switch to HM plot now. This is the first time we are talking about this topic. Uh, HM plot really essentially means uh, having the plotting ability in Hypermesh. It has existed for a while. Uh, it always existed there in the form of curve editor. Uh, to be very honest, this is not exactly a post processing topic uh, under double quotes, but uh, just making sure that it reaches the audience. I'll repeat what uh, also OptiStruct interface and Dyna interface uh, webinars are going to talk about. So uh, first of all, Curve editor in Hypermesh uh, is now going to use new infrastructure. We have been talking about it. We are we have been trying to get the hypergraph technology as a plotting module uh, and use that at, uh, behind the scene for curve editor. There are multiple objectives for that. First of all, the modernization of things, but secondly, very basic or very important user problems. Uh, we wanted to uh, introduce the functionalities to import from CSV files or export to CSV files, uh, which which seems like a very obvious uh, use case or obvious function for anybody to do it from here. Uh, there were also some limitations put by the previous technology that we could only copy so much content from a given Excel uh, file out there. Uh, that's not the case anymore. You can always copy as much as you want. Uh, we have added a new search and filter technology. Uh, so you can you can either filter out the curves with your criteria or just search a very specific thing. Uh, you can also hit the F key on the screen to fit, or you can dock and undock this entire frame right here. So let's quickly si switch to that actually. So if I switch to a model that had let's say three curves, uh, we follow the same same uh, exact routine. You go to model ribbon, click the curves. And it will bring up the new curve editor. Uh, when I click on anything, obviously it will bring up the new curve editor. If I zoom into it or zoom out of it, I have the right click option to say fit all, and it's going to do that. Or I could have done the same thing with F key. Uh, the biggest plus that I want to talk about was adding a curve and perhaps importing the CSV. Now, here I'm going to use the CSV from I'll probably let's go to quickly my temp directory and go to the GTA, say export CSV. So I got the CSV right here. Uh, if I zoom out, obviously it will then finally fit the screen. Uh, after doing this, we can also think about copying as many data lines as, as we want because we have tried to bring a lot of functionalities from table view and a lot of functionalities from hypergraph over here. You can expect things to happen uh, in that order. You can think about cutting or thinking about this more like a, a more interactive table than before. Now talking about the search and filtering, uh, it's it's been a common problem. Uh, we have users who have over 2000 or 3000 curves in a given model, uh, and that's where this search or filtering comes very handy. Now, this is a very simple example. I know that there are three curves that start with define. There is one curve that just starts with curve one, right? So if I say define and hit enter, uh, because I'm trying to use the find functionality. Now, what it's going to do is uh, search through the curves and it only highlight, uh, only highlight the curves that meet your criteria. So now I can cycle through these uh, and just get what I wanted. I can also change the criteria on which I'm I'm trying to do this search. Uh, I think this is one of the first times where you will see this, but going for going forward, when we take over new uh, newer places with this similar technology, you'll see this search fun functionality probably more often. Uh, same goes with this search technology right here. I'm going to deactivate one of those, and let's say this time I want to go for define. Now this time it kind of filters out you see that the curve one is not even shown here. Uh, that way you can obviously make the most out of this uh, when you have a lot of curves on your screen. The last thing about this, I mean, I can obviously take this to another screen and you know keep this open while I'm working on my model. At the same time, now I can even dock this into my browser. And this is the 
this is the benefit that we get with newer technologies coming into hyperwork so uh now i can dock this or i could have even docked it in my uh old panel area or i can go into the secondary browser area wherever i want to go uh i can obviously take it back into the original space that i wanted and close it when i don't need it so that's all about everything we have done in the curve editor now going to a proper post processing topic in plotting so plotting module uh, has much more to offer than just doing a curve that is required for a solver we can actually help uh, every user to create dashboard and to create the dashboard obviously your data is not going to come always from a solver perspective or a solver card you will always have data coming from various places in in the model it could be a simple uh, set of xy data you could have maybe created a table uh, let's say from a workflow such as matrix browser or you could have some results loaded in your hm post session and you just want to create a chart out of it so what we are trying to do now is get all these data types provide them into a uh, a chart types selection and from there you will get into an entity and eventually this logic will follow into solvers if you want however right now we'll just talk about the logic until the chart entity concept so uh, because this doesn't associate with the solver obviously none of the solver interfaces are going to be really affected by this uh, eventually this functionality uh, we have intended this to replace the plot panel or plot entity altogether uh, so that's why obviously the mesh quality that you you have that uses the plot entity will obviously start using this uh, probably from the uh, next releases uh, and also there are newer possibilities now if you had a material entity on the screen it will obviously uh, get the benefit of this technology around so if i quickly switch to a model where you know i can can show this on the screen uh, i have chart entity here let's create that again if i were to create it i just have to go to the browser say line chart and line chart is the only type we have introduced so far that's why it gives only one selection and this is where it asks for a source so if i click this uh, it's going to ask in a table what are the values i wanted i can again import here from a direct csv i can say go to my temp folder and basically get the same exact file that we tried to plot in the curve editor just now and when i say right click review it's going to plot the same exact curve again same exact functionality i can zoom out say fit all does the same exact thing i can even select the curve over here and say values and now it will show me which values i just plotted uh now let's try to maybe try something else instead of direct input what if i had a table already created in the matrix browser so let's say i have five elements here selected i have i have calculated some stress result using some values that i found in the model let's go ahead and actually use that table all it needs is actually some table to be registered over here so whether it is coming from matrix browser or elsewhere it doesn't really matter uh now i have selected the table that i just created uh i'm going to select the functions on x and y axis I'm going to say okay calculate its stress and hit review when i do that uh, obviously it will come up with uh with a preview so again it does it does the same job if i ask for values it will show me the values that i was uh looking for and that way it can do its job finally uh if i add another chart entity let's say this time i want to plot some results uh now we have some result already on the screen what i'm going to do is quickly pick a few elements and on x axis for this release we have just kept it to showing entity id uh for y axis you can choose obviously whichever data type suits your goal and you can hit review and obviously fit all so this is in element what chart entity is trying to do for you uh and like i said in future it's it's going to support more workflows uh so this is the beginning but if you have any workflows that that need the chart entity obviously reach out to us and we can help you out finally let's jump to the report uh the last part of my presentation so 
we know that we have multi-model setup in Hypermesh. Uh, and model summary report, obviously, these are relies on the Hypermesh model. So far, because we had only one Hypermesh model, it was pretty simple and straightforward for us to find the model. Also, there was never a use case of users trying to create results from places that they are not even looking at. But however, now uh, I have this session with three HM models, and I also have this model summary dialog that allows you to select whichever model you want. Let's say I've, I have uh, a certain frame that is on page two, so I can select it right from here, and I can hit export and it will do the job of exporting. Uh, I can also choose a couple of modules and say interactive, and it will add it to the report browser. So when it does it, uh, obviously you'll see that the modules eventually get added. All those modules also have the same selection available here. So I'm going to skip the export part in that interest of time, but you know this is a very straightforward uh, addition, which was very much logical and need of the time. So it's right here for you when it was demanded. Now from here, I'll hand it over to Varun, uh, who is going to take it over for Hyperview and other topics. Thank you, Sandesh. Uh, so for Hyperview, uh, in this release, I want to highlight uh, three main updates. Um, so I'll just jump straight into my presentation. I want to mention a few improvements and enhancements we have done to the measure tool. Uh, I'll just highlight a few here. Uh, first one is a new workflow for minimum distance measure. Um, as you may be aware, uh, so in the previous release, the minimum distance measure was uh, supported only via the browser. Um, we did introduce this guide bar workflow for the other measure types, uh, but minimum distance was not uh, supported in that. In this release, we have now added minimum distance also. Um, the workflow is very straightforward. You set the measure type to minimum distance. Uh, you basically get two selectors, uh, one to pick entities on the from side, another to pick the entities on the to side. Um, so the entities can be uh, components, elements, or nodes. Um, so you can go back and forth and pick, uh, make your selections um, until you're satisfied. You can you know change it. Uh, and they do have the advanced selector um, button to be able to pick uh, not just graphically, but pick by uh, any other method uh, that we support for those entities. Uh, and once you have made the selection, you can hit the create button and a minimum distance appears on the screen. Uh, in addition, uh, you can also uh, just uh, specifically for the minimum distance, you can also uh, review uh, the from and to sets uh, for those uh, measures. Uh, you can also edit them after you've created. You can go in and edit. Uh, these are supported um, as you as you may already be aware of. These are supported for minimum distance, and the new workflow uh, also supports them. Uh, the next item uh, I want to highlight is that we we now allow selection of both the measure items as well as the measure groups. Uh, you may be aware that in Hyperview we do have uh, groups uh, of measures uh, where you know you have a bunch of individual measure items under it. Um, so now we show uh, both the measure groups uh, as well as the underlying items in the browser tree itself. Uh, so what this uh, allows you to do is that you can uh, uh, you can do you do see a selector for the measures here, so you can graphically select any measure item and it gets highlighted in the browser tree, or you could do the other way. You can select it from the browser tree and it gets highlighted in the graphics. Uh, both ways are possible. And once you have made your selection, uh, there is a context menu um, uh, on the right click, which allows you to delete the measure, edit the measure, or review the measure. Now, as I just mentioned, edit and review are available right now only for the minimum distance uh, measure type, but in future, we plan to expand it for the other measure types. So all this is possible uh, with the addition of measure items directly in the browser tree. Um, and uh, in terms of the functionality itself, uh, we have now added new options for magnitude uh, display for any distance based measures. So uh, in addition to the default, which is based on the three components X plus Y plus Z, uh, the user now has also an option to see measure magnitude in terms of X plus Y, X plus Z or Y plus Z. Uh, or not display magnitude at all. Um, obviously, we will we will show uh, what type of uh, calculation is used for the magnitude. It will it will be displayed on the screen. Uh, it will also be displayed in the uh, curve that you create from the measure, so that it's obvious to the user that you know the measurement magnitude is based on you know two components instead of three components. So we we clearly show this information. 
Uh, so that's on the measure uh, related enhancements. Then um, there are other uh, few other important uh, enhancements that I want to highlight, uh, starting with the copy to clipboard uh, functionality. Um, so uh, this is a very uh, useful enhancement, um, as you may uh, all be aware of. You know, many times engineers you know want to take their results data from uh, from the application into a Excel or spreadsheet for further. Uh, calculations or further manipulation of the data. Um, and uh, traditionally what we we were supporting is that you had to plot the data first, um, then you know uh, query the data, uh, like go into the query tool. And then once you have the data in a query table, you had the option to export it to a CSV. Uh, now we can bypass all that step, uh, directly uh, plot the data and directly copy that data into a clipboard. Um, and once uh, so we have the option uh, on the right click context menu to copy the uh, data. You can copy displayed contour data, vector data, tensor data or deformation data. Uh, and you can paste them directly uh, into the spreadsheet. Uh, and the nice thing about this is the data comes in uh, formatted. Uh, so you don't have to you know, separate the text back into columns and other things. You don't have to do that. So for example, if you have corner data, you may have multiple values for the same entity. Uh, when you paste it into the spreadsheet, these are already sorted out into columns, uh, separate columns, so you don't have to do that task. Uh, so this is a nice uh, enhancement. A uh, couple of things I'll mention is that uh, it will work on the displayed data. Um, so if you have a contour vector only on a few of the entities, it only copies those. So it basically uh, works based on what's displayed on the screen. Um, and also, if you're copying a lot of uh, entity data for a lot of entities, there is a uh, progress bar uh, that is shown in the bottom area of the application. You can even uh, stop the loading uh, if you think it's taking a lot of time. That's also possible. Uh, and then since this is all based on, you know, uh, copy to clipboard functionality, at the moment it is supported on Windows, uh, which I think will cover most of the use cases we want to cover. Uh, we, uh, we can... Um, we can copy the data on Linux, but uh, right now uh, th there is a limitation with respect to uh, pasting the data. So we are working on that probably in the next release. We might uh, support on Linux as well. Uh, moving on to other enhancements I want to mention. Uh, we are supporting now part sets in Hyperview. Um, previously, we were supporting part data in the form of part assemblies or parts, um, which we were showing in the browser uh, main view. Now we will see also if the file contains part set information that is also shown in the main view uh, of the results browser. And uh, this is a flat list that we show in the main view. And if you double click on the parts folder, you can get into a parts uh, specific view where you can see the hierarchical information uh, for both part assemblies and part sets. Uh, then a few small enhancements which will make the user's life easier. Uh, one is that you can now double click on any uh, sub case or step to make it current. Uh, you don't have to you know, right click every time to make it current. Um, this is something we have you know, added it. It's, it was already supported, I think, in HM Post, and we have now uh, made the same change in Hyperview as well. Um, then we have introduced a couple of shortcuts to quickly save and restore a view uh, on the screen. Um, again, this is something HyperMesh was supporting, and we have now added it in Hyperview also. So you can use the Control Plus uh, Num key 0 to 9. Uh, to save any view on the screen and uh, use the num key to quickly restore that view. Um, so user defined view is created in the browser, which is getting restored when you hit the number uh, corresponding to that view. Um, and then uh, another uh, request that we keep uh, getting from uh, designers who use Hyperview player is support for space mouse. Uh, so we have now uh, added uh, Hyperview player support for space mouse. Um, I think I'll just quickly uh, show a demo and then uh, uh, hand over the presentation to Stefan. So I will show you uh, the measure enhancement here. So like I said, the measure items can be now selected. There is in the selector, you will see two options, measures and measure groups. Uh, so you can go into measures and pick any of the items. For example, I'll pick the measure item on the screen and you can see that it is highlighting the uh, item. That it corresponds to you can right click it and if you want you can delete it or uh, in case of minimum distance you will have the option to edit it as well uh, and if you switch uh, between measures and measure groups uh, it will do the binding change and here you can see it picked the measure group and uh, as a consequence picked all the items under the measure group as well 
Um, so that's on the measure uh, enhancement side. And uh, for the copy to clipboard, you know, I have plotted uh, some uh, tensor tensors here, stress tensors here. So simply, you know, right click on the screen. You have a copy to clipboard option. Uh, based on what's plotted, you will see the options appearing. So if you have contour data plotted, it will show that option. But right now you can say, you know, this copy to clipboard displayed contour data. And you can come into your spreadsheet. And uh, you know, simply paste the data. And as I was mentioning, this is already uh, pre-formatted. Um, and you know, we have some default uh, data that we are displaying for that uh, top uh, for that plot type, which makes you know the most sense. Uh, we do plan to do a few more enhancements in the next releases. I think that covered what I wanted to show. Um, I will now hand over the presentation to Stefan, uh, who will take over and present on automation. Thank you. Thanks. OK, I demo now the news in automation in 2022.3. So a big improvement has been done in HWC for command recording with the derived load case support. So we have complete coverage of derived load cases with the following new commands. So if you create a derived load case, we record that uh, the load case will be created. And then when you add uh, the simulations, it will be at by file if you use a single result file. We have a powerful range syntax here, and here you have to be aware that we support two types of IDs when you record. So the first is we support the subcase ID, which comes from the result file from the solver basically here. But you can also use this is LO. So if you create a subcase, this is what you get recorded, but you can also use li, the index, and this is just the index of the subcase independent from the solar ID, uh, one, two, three, eight, et cetera. And uh, in addition, <coughs> very important, we have wildcard support for both subcase and simulation. So if you want to customize your command, which is recorded, you can say, for example, hello all or last, and here for this, uh, what I demo here is we go create a derived load case over all sub over all subcases, and have the last three simulations per subcase. So very powerful tool. When you create a derived load case from multiple files, we introduced the usage of file sets. So recording is. Uh, if you record more two or more uh, uh, derived load case, if you create with two or more result files, this command result files at create will be recorded. And then it will be when you add the simulations to the derived load case at by file set will be recorded. So file set can be created in two ways. So if you record, I have two result files here. Uh, then it will be by file lists. So at by file, comma separated file lists. And here you see the, the load for true or false. By default, it's false, but will be recorded. And uh, so that the data is not loaded when you create the set, but you can also during the creation of the set that all the data is already loaded in memory. You can customize this. And then the second one is you can create the file set at by directory. In this way, this you have to type with IntelliSense, you get interactive help. Uh, you can define a root directory and a search string, and then all the files will be in this directory will be searched. If you have a recursive search true, then all the subdirectories will also be searched for this file. I have a quick live demo of this one. So let's quickly show uh, here uh, the first one. So the def uh, derived load case will be created, then it will be set to type envelope, and then add by file with the result file here. Uh, it's from the first live case, all simulations, and then the subcase will be made active. When I file this one up, the session is loaded and you will see the derived load case is created with all the 11 simulations of load case one. The next quick is I use a file set. So this one is created manually. I create the file set FS1 and then add by directory. 
This has the result directory, the search of A3D and file records, uh, file records search true. And then I create the envelope, uh, the derived load case, it's set to type envelope, and then add by file set. And this one goes to the first subcase in all these files and has the last three of these. And then the subcase, uh, the derived load case is made active. I fire up this demo. So you see, I got here the derived load case created. And when I go there and show the files in the derived load case view, you see all the four files found, which are here in this, yeah, DOE1, DOE2, this was the file which will be searched. So very effective to, if you want to create a, a derived load case over hundreds of load cases and it, et cetera. So highly effective way to uh, produce, where is this one? Okay, the next thing I want to show is the animate ones. So uh, it always came up that people want to animate a selection of a window or page once to make sure that curves, measure curves, legends, it, et cetera, are up to date. For this one, uh, and then they want that the previous time steps are restored so that they don't change, nothing should change in the session prime. So for this one, we introduced uh, the following commands, HWD page animate once and for and HWD window animate once. Be sure that is not recorded. And for this also, we have the range syntax. So you can say current page, current window active or a given range of this. I do a quick live demo. So I do my demos always with the, so I load the uh, demo file. And then if you see here, I want to have only the active window. This goes pretty fast, I, I think uh, for teams. So you see it. And when I want to do it, for example, for all pages, I can, it just changes the pages. And then you see that the whole session is updated. If you see here, uh, uh, you see here the command which is recorded. When I copy this one to TZL, you see it can be, of course, used in TZL like all the other stuff. And so very simple to get this done. Uh, in the extension I use for demo purposes for the seminar, you see if I look at the ribbon XML for the action item, it's just a simple command. Before it was procedures which have complex code. Now, even for this action item, uh, I have only one sim simple command and that's all. So very effective way to update. The last thing I quickly want to show is extensions. We can now load uh, start HWX with predefined extensions. For this, we introduce the HWX plugin variable support also for hybrid desktop. So you see here, uh, in this example, I put two directories into this plugin uh, environment variable. And then you see the first one is uh, contains only one extension. The second directory here, the examples, contains five examples, and they all are loaded. Please be aware that the remove button for everything for now, which came with this HWX plugins variable, is disabled. So you, if you want to disable the remove button for your own customized extension, you can do it with the keyword removable set to false. In the next version, we will also that everything which is registered automatically by HWX plugins with a new keyword that you can even auto load it. So that finished uh, my part of the presentation. I thank you all for your attention. Thanks a lot.